3 John 2, we've been in a series called Soul. In 3 John 2, John prays for Gaius. He says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in what? Come on, say it loud. All things. And be in health, even as your soul prospers. So notice what he says. He says, everything in your life is going to prosper in the proportion as your soul, which is your what? Your mind, your will, your emotions. As your soul prospers, everything in your life prospers. How many know you're not, pro you're not, you're not in prosperity if your marriage is not prospering? You're not in prosperity if your kids aren't loving God. You're not in prosperity if, if you're not doing well in the, the things that God has put you in to do well in. So he says, you will prosper in all things, even as your soul prospers. And be in health, he says. So your body is actually, your physical health is affected by what's happening in your mind, your will, your emotions. We looked at it last week. You know, there's so many verses in the Bible that says it's just when we have unforgiveness, when we have bitterness, when, we have, when we're holding on things, to things in our heart, it says actually it's rottenness to your bones. Another verse, says, another verse says it dries up your bones. How many don't want dry bones? Come on, we don't want dry bones. But then another verse says that laughter is what? Good like medicine to your body. So even doctors will tell you today that your mindset, that what's happening in your emotions, right? A few years ago, uh, you know, we, we, we found out that every time you have a negative thought, it actually releases a destructive chemical in your body that begins to attack your organs, right? So what's happening in your emotions, what's happening in your thoughts even affects your physical body. So John prays for guys. He says, beloved guys, I pray that you prosper in all things as your soul's prospering and for you to be in health. So I believe that every prayer that the apostles pray in the New Testament that we could actually begin to pray for ourselves. So I like to actually rewrite them. I was doing that this morning with one in Colossians, but I kind of rewrote this so we could pray it together. Come on, are you ready to make this declaration this morning? Come on, say it with me. Thank you, Lord. That no, no, we say it together. All right. Thank you, Lord, that my soul prospers. You prosper me in all things and keep me in health. Let's do it again. Thank you, Lord, that as my soul prospers, you prosper me in all things and keep me in perfect health. Okay, let's do it a third time by pretending you're at Joel Osteen's church. All right. Thank you, Lord, that as my soul prospers, you prosper me in all things and keep me in perfect health. Amen. All right. So as our soul is prospering, our mind, our will, our emotions, God causes everything in our lives to begin to lift. Two weeks ago, I taught you on the set point. We all have a set point in our life. Your life is not determined by you being lucky or unlucky. Your life is not determined by external factors of your life, your life over the... Now, again, things happen in our life, right? Things happen, but it's give it enough time, you end up where your set point is. Like, so if, if your set point is dialed to poverty because that's what you were used to growing up and, and in your mind you think that's what you deserve and, and we could, you know, we can't get you out of poverty by giving you a million dollars because give it enough time, pretty soon you will be right back to where you were or even worse, you know, prior to you getting that million dollar check. If your set point doesn't change, right? Your set point determines that. You could lose everything but if you have a prosperous soul, pretty soon you'll gain back everything you lost. Because why? That is your, say it with me, set point. That is your set point. Then last week we talked about pathways to wholeness, humility, and different things that we have to put into our life so that wholeness. Because we, we, we are our own enemies when it comes to God healing us. You know that? We're our own enemies. But when we posture ourselves and we create the pathways for healing in our life, healing naturally comes into your life. Did you know you don't have to ever beg God to heal you? I'm talking emotionally and physically. You don't have to ever beg God to heal you. You just have to remove the hindrances that are keeping your healing. Right? Because he's already done the work. So we have to have the posture and the pathways for healing to happen in our life. So healing 
and growing the soul. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about behavior modification. We're not talking about changing what you do so you can feel better about yourself. We're talking about letting God heal your heart, heal your soul, heal your, heal your emotion, your memories, your past, so that it changes who you are, your future, and, and your set point in life, right? We're not talking about just don't do this, do this, don't do that, because how many realize that doesn't work over time? How many have you been to the gym lately, right, since January 1st? Like, it's hard to get on a machine <laughs> because everybody decided to get rid of some baggage that they picked up from Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that. Yeah, really quiet. I'm not talking about you. Relax. All right. So, so, what, so what happens is every year, this happens every year, right? You go to the gym at the beginning of the year. The place is packed. And then come end of March, beginning of April, praise God, you can get on the machines again. So what happened? Behavior modification didn't work. Right? It didn't work. Come on, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever been on a diet before? The rest of you are liars. <laughs> Don't lie in the house of God. You might get struck. <sighs> okay, let me see your hand. How many are, how many ever been on a diet ever? Okay, how many are on a diet right now? All right, so um, like for years and years and years, I've always started the morning with a diet. Right? So in the morning, I'm in a di on a diet. At lunchtime, I'm usually on a diet. Dinner time, I will start my diet tomorrow. <laughs> Anybody been there? Why? Because I was trying to modify my behavior. And then what happens is, so you tell somebody that you're on a diet. You're trying to get, you know, you know you're, you're trying to get rid of the fats that the muscle shows. So, um, and you tell somebody who's one of those like healthy people. You know what I'm saying? And what do they tell you? Every time you tell them you're on a diet, they say, no, it's not a diet that you need. It's a health, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> right? Come on, I, I know what I'm talking about. Now, but you know, it might be annoying when they say that, but they're true. They're right. Because a diet is behavior modification. A lifestyle is how you see yourself. Is how you see it, how you should live your life. And, and then because you see yourself as that, and then you begin to see the fruit of it come to pass in your life. So you can't just change what you do, but you have to change how you see yourself. Let me give you this phrase. It's not good English, but I hope you remember. You do because of who? In other words, what you do is because of who you see yourself to be. Right? You do because of who? And we all have areas and we have patterns in our life where we struggle with the do because of the who, but usually we don't realize it's the who that's affecting the do. Sounds like Dr. Zeus, I know. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? So when you, if you're struggling with the do in your life, you better check and say, in that area, how do I see myself? You know, I've been going to the bank a lot more lately and uh, just because I don't like their machine or their app. So I've been going inside the bank more. And um, not once, though, have I gone in there and looked around. I'm like, I'm the only one in here right now. I just got to pretend I'm scared of a COVID. Put a mask on. Put a cap. Don't even have to show it. As long as they think I have one. I could walk out of here with some blessing. I was saying this at the North Campus. They're all looking at me like, oh, oh my God, Pastor. <laughs> like, you've thought this through, you know? But not once am I tempted to do that. Like, I'm not texting my wife saying, honey, pray for me. I'm going to the bank. <laughs> grace, grace, grace. Get thee behind me, Satan. It's not an issue for me. Why? Because I don't see myself as a thief. So I don't walk I'm, I'm not tempted, right? You have all sorts of areas in your life that you see others. You're like, what's wrong with them? Why can't they just quit that? Because it's not an issue for you, right? You're not tempted in that area. But there's other areas that you struggle with because you, you have a hard time stopping to do. And it's because of the who. It's because of how you see yourself. See, I don't see myself as a thief, so I don't steal. I don't see myself as a lot of things, and I don't do that. But I believe in the areas that we struggle with the fruit, there's something wrong with the root, 
that has to do with the who, right? How we see ourselves. And we all have those issues. Listen, we're in a fallen creation. We all have issues that we struggle with that, that have to do with our identity, the, the things that we struggle with and things that we reach for when we are under stress, when, when, when different things happen, we, we, we reach for those things. I mean, what I'm talking about, right? Kind of like talking about the being on the diet thing. Sometimes I'll go home at night and we have like a whole bunch of cabinets in our house and I'm going through all the cabinets one by one by one by one by one, going looking in the fridge and going, and then I go through the cabinets a second time in case something else was put in there while I didn't, wasn't looking. <laughs> now, I'm not hungry when I do that. Come on, anybody ever do that? I'm not hungry when I do that. I realized recently why I did that. I do that because after a long day, I'm kind of wound up a little tight. I'm a little stressed. I dealt with some weird people. <laughs> and I come home and I'm just like wound up a little bit and I'm trying to like, I need some peace. I'll find it in the cabinet. <laughs> right? So that's to do. But really I have to look at the who and say, okay, why do I do that? What is it that triggers me, that winds me like that, that I'm reaching for something to give me comfort rather than the Holy Spirit who is my comforter? Right? So we all have those issues, and Timothy had, the, had some of those issues. Timothy was a pastor. He was a pastor of the church in Ephesus, and he was a protege. He was a mentee of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul mentored him. Now, we would think if the Apostle Paul mentored us, we'd be like spiritual giants and have no problems. But Timothy had some issues. Here's what Paul says to Timothy in his first letter. He says, Timothy, he says, let no one despise your youth. Amen. But be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Now remember what he said to him in the beginning. He says, let no one despise your youth. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. Why was he neglecting the gift? Because he's intimidated because of his age which was given to you by prophecy and the laying on of hands and the, of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So Paul's saying, Timothy, listen, I know there's some older people in the church that are coming to you saying, hey, you youngster, you can't lead us. You're younger than we are. He says, but don't be intimidated by that. God has put you there. And there's a gift on the inside of you that was given to you by the laying on of hands. Don't neglect that gift. Stop, stop ignoring what God is doing through your life because you're intimidated because of fear. Right? That's what he's telling them. And then in the next letter, he says this to him. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. So in other words, come on, let me tell you again. I know I wrote you already, but I'm still hearing. You're having some issues there. Come on, Timothy. Stir up the gift of God. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Why was he not stirring it up? Why, why was he ignoring the gift that was in him? Why was he intimidated because of his youth? He had a fear of man. He was afraid. So he said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So here's point number one. What you believe about yourself is the foundation of your life. Right? What you believe about yourself is the foundation of your life. So here's what happens. So we, you know, we read a great book or we hear a message like this and we're like, okay, this is who I am and I believe this is who I am and all that. So you could say you're a certain thing, but if you don't believe it in your heart, you have an incongruency going on. So what's, what's the incongruency? It's the state or condition of not being in an agreement. So, so your mind says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But your heart says, man, I'm just the old sinner. And I, I just mess up. That's, that's all I do. I'm always failing God. I'm not even worthy to be in his presence. I mean, there's a lot of people like that. Your mind says righteousness. Your heart says sinner. So what does that do? That creates an incongruency in your life. So in other words, you know, you become split between what you believe and what you think. So if you're going to construct a healthy life, it begins with what you believe about yourself. So your foundation is so important because well, what happens is a faulty foundation will create cracks in your soul. You got to have a good foundation. I mean, realize that the bigger the building, the more you got to dig deeper on the foundation. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever driven by like this big building, you know, before they build it? And it seems like they're just working on the ground forever. 
It's like, come on, get with it, get with it, right? It's like, why are they taking so long? Those contractors, come on, get with it. But it seems like once they're done with the foundation, the rest just goes up quick. Because right? the foundation is so important. Especially if you do a remodel, I mean, you got to tear some stuff up in order to build out the foundation if you're going to build bigger. If you want to build your life bigger, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to tear out some stuff to expand on the foundation that's in your life. Because if you try to expand who you are on the foundation you already have, you're going to get some cracks in your soul. I think this is why some pastors all of a sudden when they get you know, famous really quick, but they haven't built their foundation and then they fall. What happened? They couldn't handle the big that came to them because it created a crack in their soul. You got, you got to extend it out. It, it takes work. I remember some years ago when we built our admin building, uh, there was already a building there, but we tore it all down and left up a couple beams so that way it could be a remodel. It's cheaper for permits. And, uh, but then we had to go add to the foundation, connect them together, and then we could build something that was bigger. If you want to build something that's bigger, you have to work on that soul. And, and it really the foundation of that is how do you see yourself? If you're going to construct a healthy life, it begins with what you believe about yourself. What we believe about ourselves is not what we actually think we believe about ourselves. So how do you know really what you believe about yourselves? Actually, your actions and the things you do, your fruit, what you produce is a better sign of what you actually believe about yourself than what your mind says you believe about yourself. Now again, I'm not talking about fluff, right? I'm not talking about the self-help stuff where we stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm great enough, I'm good looking enough, I got white teeth, I got hair, you know. All that fluff, stuff that is just fluff, right? At the end of the day, we know it's fluff. But I'm talking about truth that gets on the inside of you and it begins to heal the cracks. It begins to transform you on the inside and brings you to the place of becoming who you really are. See, there's this word in theology called sanctification. It's a fancy word, but it simply means this. Traditionally, it means becoming more like God, right? So I used to think the way... I, I go through sanctification, becoming more like God, is if I quit all the stuff that doesn't please him and do all the stuff that pleases him, then I become sanctified. I know that's a losing battle. That's a losing battle. But here's what I realized. Here's what I learned. Sanctification is simply this, the process of becoming who you really are. Right? It's the process of becoming who you really are. So when you start discovering who you really are, and that starts becoming the foundation of your identity, your do actually starts to begin to change anyway. Your do begins to change because now all of a sudden you figure out who you really are in Christ Jesus. See, simply becoming who you already are. This is the battle of identity. See, knowledge is not enough. We have to build on the foundation of truth. Not your truth, truth. And by the way, you don't have your truth, you just have your opinion. God has the truth. So, so the, his truth has to be highly integrated in our life. Point number two. So we have to stand on the truth, right? Standing on the truth. There's one set of truth, and that comes from the Bible. It's God's truth, and it's God's truth that sets you free. You know, we quote all the time, you know, people who don't even know Jesus quote this verse. The truth shall... That's wrong, though. The truth doesn't set you free. If the truth sets you free, everybody would be free. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus did not say the truth will set you free. Look at it. Here's what it says. John 8, 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews, those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall what? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The word know there actually comes from a word, uh, a derivative of the Greek word konosko, which means to know by experience and to know intimately. Right? Not to just know in your mind, but to know intimately. But notice what Jesus says. He says, if you abide in my word. If you abide in my word. 
See, there's two ways to renew your mind. And many people don't talk about this, but two ways to renew your mind. It's not on your notes. You might, you're going to want to write this down. Number one is holding on to the truth. Not just knowing the truth, but holding on to the truth. All right? So Jesus says, if you abide in my word, the word abide there means to stay at a given place or to reside or to stay. Here's what Jesus is saying. Stay on my word when everything around you is contradictory. When everything in your mind and emotion says you're this, stay on my word that says who you really are. See, it's not the knowledge of what the Bible says that sets you free. It's staying on the truth in the face of contradiction over and over and over and over until it becomes revelation in your soul. See, it's holding on to the truth that actually then sets you free. So number one, you got to hold on to the truth. You just, you just got to stand on it. The, the word doesn't transform you because you quoted it once. Or you got it on a sticker to put on your car. Or you tattooed it on you. I mean, that's commitment, guys. That is commitment to put it in ink. But that still doesn't transform you. It changes your body. But it doesn't transform your soul. But it's staying on the word. That brings transformation. Okay, here's the second thing that renews your mind, which I don't, I don't ever hear talked about. It's the presence of God. The presence of God transforms you, renews your mind. Now, how does the presence of God trans, uh, renew your mind? It's because the presence of God takes the word that's in your head and drops it down into your heart. Right? It goes from knowledge. That's where we begin. We begin with knowledge. But, but it, it, the presence of God takes that truth that's in your mind and drops it about 12 inches down in your heart, then everything changes. Right, we talked about that last week. Revelation changes everything. It begin, you begin to get revelation of who you really are. You're not just saying it. Now it's integrated on the inside of you. In the presence of God, we actually begin to see who we really are. The presence of God, listen, people, the presence of God is transformational. That's why people fly from all over the country to get into rooms where the presence of God is. Right? Why? Because the presence of God is transformational. How do we transform a city? We get them into the presence of God. How do we transform lives? We get them in the presence of God. So the presence of God is transformational. So what happens is when we get into the presence of God, we begin to see who we really are. And the presence of God, which is light, say light, that light begins to expose what we really think about ourselves. Those areas that created the cracks in the foundation. Right, the presence of God does that. I told you a story last week about how the Lord just brought up something back from my junior high days. And listen, none of us are trying to remember junior high. And, uh, and the Lord just brought up something that I would have never, 10 years of counseling, ever thought that it was affecting me. And it was. And in that one moment, the Lord revealed it. I was able to process it five minutes later. Like, I'm good. It doesn't always happen that way. But the presence of God is what reveals. Now, this, you know, this, this whole thing about us holding on to lies is the very first weapon that Satan used and is still using. Right? In the Garden of Eden, you know the story? You know, Adam and Eve, they're, they're like, in blue, they're in heaven on earth. And then the serpent Satan shows up, and here's how he starts off. Did God really say? Just in the way he says it, he's saying, well, God's a liar, and he's holding out on you. Did God really say you shall not eat of that? And then here's, here's the lie that Satan said to Eve. He says, listen, when you eat of it, you will be like God. That's why God doesn't want you to eat it, because you'll be like him. But here's what Eve forgot. She was already like him. Right? When God created Adam and Eve, he says, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let him have dominion. He, she was already like God, but she took the bait of what Satan wanted her to do or the avenue that Satan promised that she would be like God. Think about that for a moment. When we do things, aren't we really trying to get what God says we could have in him? Follow this thought for a moment. So they sin. The moment they sin, all of a sudden, they realize that they're naked. Or south again, naked. Naked. So in that moment, they realize they're naked. Now, were they naked the whole time? But now they realize they were naked. Why did they realize they were naked? Because shame came in. Every time we, 
we do what Satan wants us to do, what is the result in? See, we think we're going to get something good that God's holding out on us, but at the end, we actually get shame. So here's, here's what Adam and Eve do. They stretch out, and they're like, let's get some leaves. Oh, and by the way, they were hiding from God. Like God can't find you. But anyway, they were hiding from God. And that's exactly what we do. We hide from God. Make ourselves busy. We can't go to church. We can't pray. We hide from God. So anyway, they take the leaves. They put it on themselves. They reach for the leaves because of shame that came into their life, because of sin that came into their lives. You know, the leaves in our lives are those addictive behaviors. Are those things, those things that we do that we don't want to do, but we end up doing because we're trying to cover the shame. See, every time you start stretching out for the leaves in your life, that's it, and we all have them. For you, it might be eating, it might be spending, it might be pornography, it might be other things. But you stretch out for the leaves, and the moment you do, here's what you have to remember. It's not the leaves that you need. Something's going on with the foundation of who you are and how you see yourself. They would have never stretched out for the leaves to cover themselves if, if, she, if she would have actually realized that she already was like God and didn't need to do Satan's method to try to be like God, and then it leads to shame, and then she has to get the leaves in her life. Are you tracking? I totally took the long route in this service. But that's, that's what happens. You know, um, this last year, I think it was last year, maybe longer than that, I realized in my own life that I always had this like low grade of anxiety, right? Now, some of you might deal with that. And, and I've, in the past, I've dealt with not low grades, I've dealt with high octane, the best <laughs> level of anxiety. You know, after our first and second building program, and then I've been in a building program for 22 years straight, it seems like, and uh, I hit a wall. I mean, I, I had to get help. I got a lot of help. It took me, it took me several years to, to recover from that, okay? And then, but after that, there was always this, like, this low grade of anxiety. So I always thought, well, that's normal because, you know, I have a lot of responsibilities. I carry the weight of the church, um, you, you know, and, uh, you know, you pastor a large church. All pastors of large churches have anxiety, you know. So you just kind of hear all these things and you justify it. Then this last year, I started thinking, you know, and I think the Lord was speaking to me. He says, no, that's not normal. How many of you live with things that you think are normal, but they're not normal? And, and I realized, you know, Jesus, this, you know, the word does say, be anxious for nothing. I think he means that, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then, so I really begin to drill into this with the Lord. And then I begin to realize... The reason I always had this low grade of anxiety, it wasn't because of the stress and the stuff I was carrying and all that. It was because I had an issue with fear in a certain area. See, but I wouldn't admit I had fear because I'm a faith person. Anyway, so I was struggling with this fear area in my life that had to do with how I saw myself. Because if I saw myself the way God sees myself, I wouldn't even fear in that area. And that fear area was causing anxiety in my life. If you have that low level of anxiety in your life, I guarantee you, it traces back to a place of identity in your life that needs to be adjusted to see yourself how, you really, how God really sees you. So you identify those lies. See, it's only when you're standing on the true foundation of, of who God says you are is that you overcome those things in your life, that you don't have to stretch out for the leaves. Every time you catch yourself trying to get the leaves, just remember, Okay, what triggered the anxiety thing in me? What, what triggered that identity thing in me? What, what happened just now? I mean, we all have patterns, and there's things that trigger us. Number three, you have to stand on the truth foundation. You have to stand on the truth foundation. See, what is the truth? And I want you to catch this this morning, and we're going to wrap this up, but... This is going to set you free. The truth is this. The issue of your value was settled on the cross. The issue of your value was settled on the cross. 
When you try to get yourself, you know, to get your mind to think that you're very valuable through any means outside of the settled work of, of the cross, it's fluff. If you start feeling good about yourself because you got a great job, you got a promotion, you got a lot of money, you got the house, you got the car, you got all that stuff, if that's the foundation of why you feel good about yourself, you're gonna feel really bad about yourself pretty soon. If you feel good about yourself because that guy or that woman that you, you know, that's really you know, good looking and they like you now and all that, pretty soon you're gonna feel bad about yourself. Any foundation for you to you know, feel good about who you are that's not based on the finished work of the cross is going to come crashing down because it's not a real foundation. The issue of your value is settled on the cross. How many know like a guy who uh, has this, like a junkie truck or something and he's always cleaning it and he's the same guy who parks sideways in the parking lot so nobody parks next to him because they might like ding his car? Are you here? No, I'm kidding. Anyway, so uh, you know what I'm talking about? So, and this is the same guy who's like, man, this truck's worth $20,000. It's a classic. It's old. It's not a classic. Just because it's old, it's not a classic. And like, it's worth $20,000, but it's really only worth $200. Because <laughs> how much is something worth? Something's only worth what somebody's willing to pay you for it. So you could... Lie to yourself and say it's worth $20,000, but it's only worth what somebody's willing to pay, pay you for it. How much are you worth? How much you are worth is dependent on how much somebody was willing to pay for you. What was paid for you? Jesus, God himself, the second person of the Trinity. Philippians 2 says, took the form of a man and humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that on the cross, your sins are not only forgiven, but you are now in a new covenant. You are a son and daughter of God. And not only that, the apostle Paul says that we might even die for a righteous person, but Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. And how much is that worth? I was reading this morning in Colossians, it says all things were created by him and through him and for him. He's the preeminence above all things. The prince of heaven came and died for you and I. That's how much you are worth. Right? That's how much you are worth. That's how much you're worth. And it doesn't matter the things that have happened to you in the past. Now, I'm not trying to belittle what's happened to you by saying it doesn't matter. But I'm saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't define your identity. Your identity is defined by what was paid for you, and Jesus' life was what was paid for you. That's why the Apostle Paul could say, man, if God is for us, who could be against us? I like saying it this way. If God is for me, who cares who's against me? Right? Who cares who's against me? Romans 8.31, he says it like this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall, be, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who's he then who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. That was a question. You're not so sure. No. Shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. COVID? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? Sword? No. Newsome? No. no. If somebody even worse than him gets elected in California, which is hard to imagine, it does not separate us from the love of God and what God wants to do in our state, in our life. Come on now, somebody. Right? I don't have to escape to Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Idaho. I know I'm meddling now because of the love of God. That is my value. Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. I was telling the other services, it doesn't matter. Listen, even if your spouse was to leave you, and we bind that in Jesus' name, even if they were to leave you, it does not diminish your worth. 
because your worth was determined on the cross. It was determined on the cross. <clears throat> you know, you, you could actually, as the worship team comes up, you could actually, this, this is how you live with a generous soul. It's because you know of how much value you are to God. You don't have to hold on to pettiness. You don't have to hold on to unforgiveness. You don't have to hold on to anything else because it does not determine your value. Your value is determined by God. I was telling some leaders the other day, I was teaching about having a generous soul and a prosperous soul. I'm like talking about the importance of forgiving people and just walking in love and forgiveness. And then later, I'm thinking about it later. I'm like, man, I've changed. I'm like, I genuinely, and I've been talking about this a lot, right? Forgiveness, walking and all that. It's not because I'm trying to talk myself into it. Um, I'm like, I actually like believe it. When people want to hate, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, love you, forgive you, Lord bless you, genuinely. When the haters want to hate, I'm like, oh, how can we bless them? I feel bad for them now because they're missing out on me. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? I'm like, wow. I honestly actually believe this because for a lot of years I faked it. I'm like, I actually believe it. Do you know what I think happened? I think the more I realize how much God loves me and who I am in Him, the more I really don't care what other people think. Amen. Right? So if you really struggle with what other people think, it's because yet you don't really know how much you're worth to God. And when you understand the love of God, if God be for me, who cares who's against me? Who can be against me? And I remember all the things that Paul listed, they weren't, they weren't just people. He's, he is talking about famine, tribulation, persecution, all those things. Man, you know, everybody's talking about recession. Have you heard that? Like even, I, I even hear preachers talking about recession. I'm like, oh, come out, devil. And they're all talking about recession. They're like trying to talk themselves into one. But how many realize recession is an enemy? Poverty is an enemy. So even if one was to come, because it's cyclical, they come. Even if it was to come, it's your enemy. It's not going to separate you from the love of God. God is good. God will still supply for you. God will still prosper you. God will still bless you beyond, over, and above. Why? Because it's an enemy. If you get a bad report from the doctor, sickness is not your friend. God did not bring sickness to teach you something, as the lying preachers would tell you. Sickness is an enemy. You don't have to try to beg God to heal you. You just say, okay, God, what's in the way? Let's remove that. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. The Lord, my healer. You've made a covenant of healing with me. You said in Exodus 23 that you remove sickness from the midst of me. Thank you that Jesus by his, died on the cross and by his stripes, I was healed. Right? It's an enemy. Anything that comes against your family, it's an enemy. And nothing could separate you from the love of God. No enemy. Do you know why? Because when you know how much God loves you and who you are in him, you will take authority over those things. And just walk in boldness and walk in confidence in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, stand to your feet. <clears throat> Jesus, we love you. We thank you. You love us so much. You love us so much. Come on, everybody, just, just open your heart right now to just he hear from what the Holy Spirit's gonna say to your heart. Because even right now, I believe the Holy Spirit's revealing some things to your heart some areas, maybe false self, false identity, some lies that you've believed that have put you on a faulty foundation that has caused you to uh, reach out for the fig leaves. See, as the Lord shows you those things, that means he's, he's, a, he's healing you. He's about to set you free in those areas of your life. In Jesus' name. While you're praying right now with every head bowed and eye closed, maybe you're here this morning and you're not in right relationship with Jesus. If you were to die tonight, you're not ready to go to heaven. You don't know if you're going to go to heaven. Maybe because it's because you never 
actually could remember a time you've asked Jesus to come into your life to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life. Or maybe at one time you gave your life to Jesus, but for whatever reason, you walked away. But this morning, you want to get things right with God. You want, you want to be right with God today, as of today. If that's you, and you want to be included in this prayer, I'm about to pray. Listen, without hesitation, come on, this is the days of His presence. You don't want to miss what God is doing. You need to get your life right with God. You need to come to Jesus right now without hesitation. Lift your hand up. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be included in that. Come on, thank you, thank you. I'm looking in the balcony. In the bottom level, come on, hands going up everywhere. Come on, everyone who lifted your hand, I want you to pray this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and my sins. I ask you to come into my life, <clears throat> forgive me of my sins, and I make you the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I renounce every spirit but the Holy Spirit. And according to your word, I am born again. I'm a child of God. I love God. In Jesus' name, come on, amen. Let's celebrate with them.